Welcome to The Cap, where we are here to speak with college reps and other professionals in the field of college admissions to help answer all your questions and guide you through every step of the process. So if you're serious about college admissions, you've come to the right place. Are you ready? Let's talk about it. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Durante. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and I am here to introduce you to college admissions representatives and other professionals in the field of college admissions. Our purpose is to serve you, the students and parents, so that you may gain insight straight from the people who ultimately make the decisions. Regardless of whether you apply to a particular school being highlighted in a given episode, you should listen to all of them, as each guest will give you tremendous insight and advice on every aspect of the college admissions process, prompting you to come up with your own follow-up questions for when you visit campus or meet with a college admissions representative yourself. Don't forget to visit our website, www.collegeadmissionstalk.com, or the show notes of each episode to access the alphabetical list of all the colleges available with the related audio link to the right of each school. The alphabetical list provides you with on-demand access to all of the episodes so that you may listen whenever you wish. And if you want to receive links to episodes before they are released on the podcast, along with other related resources, please fill out the email opt-in form also available on our website and in the show notes of each episode. Lastly, please email me with any questions or comments at collegeadmissionstalk at gmail.com. So are you ready? Let's talk about it. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you today Elian Paz, who's the Assistant Vice President and Dean of Admissions at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. Elian, thank you so much for being here today. How are you? I'm doing so well, and I'm really happy to be here to talk about Mac and, and also to talk about the college process. So thanks for having me. Well, it is our honor and pleasure. So, Elian, let me start by asking you, what are some of the things that you personally love about McAllister that make it so appealing for so many students to want to apply and ultimately attend? Well, I'm in my 10th year at McAllister College, and I love the people. I love the warmth of the campus, and I love the location and, of course, the academic excellence that we have at the college. And I think what might initially draw students to McAllister is that we're one of just a handful of selective liberal arts and sciences colleges in a metropolitan area. So being in the Twin Cities of St. Paul and Minneapolis, we're about 3.5 million people. So we're drawing students from major metropolitan areas, but also rural areas, too, that are interested in having the two great cities be a part of their college experience. And so that's from engaging in civic engagement, the hundreds of internships. Um, We have seven professional sports teams. Everybody gets a stadium in Minnesota. We're very generous. (laughs) Um, And I I think they, they see that as maybe an entry point. And then when they come on campus, they see what's happening on campus. We're very mission driven. We're very connected to our values at the college. Those values are internationalism, multiculturalism, academic excellence, and service to society. And so when students come on campus, they feel that there is there's something here, there's something special, and they want to be a part of that community and realize that they are going to best learn and best you know, be on their academic pathway in, in a college with small class sizes and one that really emphasizes sort of one-on-one attention and is extremely collaborative too. So if, if we can you know, have students look at small selective liberal arts colleges, there, there are quite a few of them on the East Coast, um, <laughs> but there's a really lovely collection of them in the Midwest. And, and so I think students also see, when I think about the students I work with, um, students from New York City, you know, they uh, like the idea of having a city and its opportunities, but also still want to have a tight knit campus culture, too. Well, thank you so much for that overview. And there's definitely something special, as you put it, because I read 96 percent. That's your retention rate. Ninety six percent of your first year students returned to continue their studies at McAllister, which is a testament to the great work that you do in admissions to accept the right students, but also the great work that the McAllister community, as you put it, does to foster that sense of family once they are on your campus. So let me ask, what is it about life on and off campus that makes these students so happy to be there? Well, I I think it's important to note that 
our students are coming from all over the world. So we're 2,100 students and about 23 to 24% of them are citizens of 98 countries. You know, wow. we have over 76 languages spoken, um, represented on campus, you know, all 50 states and the U.S. territories, D.C. And, um, and thinking about all of these students coming together, not being a regional institution, that they're all coming, like, not sure what college is going to be like, nervous about who they're going to have breakfast with and who they're going to hang out with on a Friday night. And so we have a lot of community engagement and collaboration that happens on campus. A big part of that is a residential experience. A big part of that is our first year course um, seminar that we offer to students and opportunities to engage in the Twin Cities as well. There is always something going on on campus. Um, we have almost 100 student organizations, um, opportunities for students to be a part of publications. They could be a DJ on our radio station, <laughs> um, club sports. One of our most popular um, club sports is our climbing club because uh, we have so many different climbing gyms in the Twin Cities. And so um, outing club as well, students who like to camp. So there are so many things to do on campus. And I think students use the Twin Cities to the degree that's comfortable to them. You know, we're, we're fortunate to have a really excellent metro transit system in the Twin Cities. And so we have three bus, uh, bus lanes on three sides of campus, including a rapid transit bus that leads every 10 minutes to two above ground light rail systems. And so students have access to the Twin Cities using public transportation which I think is a huge appeal to those that come from cities where they use public transportation. And I think sort of a novelty to those that don't have great public <laughs> transportation where they're coming from. And what a great skill to have to be able to navigate a city and being able to have that skill to just kind of look at places, find places and be able to go to them. So I would say we, um, our students really learn uh, that that first semester, they can't do everything. It is a very active campus. We have a, a student in involvement fair that has, seemingly hundreds of, of table or a hundred tables of different student organizations, different um, uh, civic engagement opportunities, club sports, uh, different music ensembles that students can be part of. And, and so you see all the first years frantically signing up for all of them <laughs> and then realizing that they have to go to meetings and engage. And so that's a part of the college experience is, is understanding limitations. And, and, you know, first and foremost, the academic experience is, is the most important one, but that they can, have opportunity to just be young people and just laugh and hang out and and you know do things that are not academic, do things outside of a laboratory. And they're gonna find a lot of those opportunities in the Twin Cities. Well, that's terrific. You mentioned the Twin Cities, your community engagement, and of course, lots of opportunities to collaborate with others. It really sounds like there's something for everyone, both on and off your campus. So thank you so much for that overview. And of course, visiting campus before committing to a school is important for a student to get the feeling of the campus and the surrounding area. So if a student is able to come to campus, what are some of the areas that they absolutely should visit? And what are some of the questions that they should be asking to help determine whether or not the school is the right fit for them? Well, definitely the student tour, the student-led campus tour is going to give students a sense of where our learning spaces and our living spaces are. And I think it's it's really important to hear that from the student ex experience and perspective. You know, we also, um, during different times of the year, have a student panel that students can, um, their parents and, and um, prospective students can ask different questions and, and they can ask anything. And, you know, the, the more sort of bold the questions are, I think our students can handle a, a lot of them, you know, but they, um, they're interested in giving a true and authentic take on the McAllister experience. That's what I appreciate about our students. They're not afraid to be honest and advocate for themselves. It's great if our students can um, eat in Cafe Mac while they're here and try the different food. I think food's super important to students. And, and I will say we are so fortunate to have many restaurants um, in right in the vicinity of the campus. So like within a block of campus, we have Mediterranean, Vietnamese, um, local organic, just to name a few of them. Um, it's a great food area in, in St. Paul. Parallel to the campus is Summit Avenue. It's the longest stretch of Victorian homes in the nation. It leads from the Mississippi River all the way to um, the St. Paul Cathedral. And you can see the, the very gorgeous state capital in the background, one of the most gorgeous state capitals in the nation. 
And on that stretch, you'll find beautiful Victorian and historic homes. It's a great spot for students. They like to run and walk down Summit Avenue. But if you're interested in architecture, it's great. Sometimes it's more the parents that are interested in that. So if you're (laughs) able to rent a car, you get to drive around and see the different neighborhoods that make up St. Paul. Being able to to walk around is, I think, so important. And I think what uh, students and families are going to see is that we don't have a large fence around campus. Uh, There is, it's very difficult to see where our campus ends and the neighborhood begins because we're fortunate to be in a neighborhood that likes us here. We're good community partners. Um, As someone that lives just four blocks from campus, I have McAllister students that live around me as well, and they're really wonderful neighbors. Um, (laughs) I can't stress how important it is to be in a neighborhood that likes you as a college. And, and and that is intentional and in that we are, are very careful to be good partners. And that is just part of the ethos of McAllister is to be good community members. And then you can see that within our neighborhood. So I would definitely say Summit Avenue and then running through part of campus is Grand Avenue. Lots of great shops and restaurants as well. We are in sort of a historic part of St. Paul. It's a beautiful residential part of St. Paul. We're still technically in St. Paul. Um, downtown is is a little bit farther away. So you're going to, it's going to take a few miles to get to the downtown of St. Paul. But while there, um, you could definitely, you know, we have so many different sports teams to check out. Um, even actually within a mile is our MLS soccer stadium, Allianz field, but uh, Target Field is, a, is um, pretty appealing to students that are, are interested in, in baseball or you know going to see a show while they're here. We have over 16 museums accessible by bus, so that could be just the world-class Walker Art Center and the Sculpture Garden to the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. Um, we have the only Somali museum outside of Somalia because we have a significant Somali um, uh, population in the Twin Cities. So I think being able to explore uh, the different downtowns um, and definitely you know, spend some time exploring St. Paul, the McAllister Groveland neighborhood. Well, that's terrific. You talk about trying the different food offerings, the recreational opportunities, and it's very important when you're on campus to get the student perspective, not only the tour guide, but speak to random students on and off campus just to get a feel of what the McAllister community is all about. And like I said, that retention rate of 96% is truly amazing. So we appreciate that overview. I was also curious, what are some of the things that students do to demonstrate their interest in attending McAllister? And do you track such things as part of your overall process? So we have a content management system that just naturally tracks student engagement. So we are are careful to monitor when we engage with students in the high school experience, when we're visiting their high school or at a college fair, because it allows us to follow up with them um, and to follow up with any questions that they may have. So we do track them as part of our system. I think it's important to also track conversations that we have with students so that we can best serve them. I think more than anything, we're we're in the, the, the business of admissions and, and the process can feel very one-sided for students, but it is our job to serve the students and the families that are interested in McAllister. And so we do track information to best serve them. I think as far as how it, it will play into the selection process, if it does, it is something that we're exploring, but it happens at um, post the application read. So it's not part of when we read an application. But if we find ourselves in a space where we have very limited um, opportunities and fewer spaces, we will we may look at that information. But I think it's really important to understand the context of demonstrated interest because it isn't black and white. It isn't binary in that I can say, well, this student visited and this student um, didn't visit because it comes down to access and resources. And some students just simply don't have advocacy in the admissions process to know what they should be doing or how they should be advocating for themselves by either sending an email of interest to an admissions counselor, attending a virtual program. And some may not just not have the resources to do that too. And so when we think about interest, we have to be really, really careful that we're understanding that student's demonstrated interest in the context of that student. 
Well, we really appreciate that. You mentioned using a content management system to track information to best serve the students in the overall process. You also indicated that you may look at it, but that's in the post application read, right? If there's a certain need and all of a sudden you see a student that has engaged, has emailed, has done a virtual visit, um, it, it may come into play later on. So I think it's important to engage in the emails. There are links. There's a way for you to realize how many students are opening the emails, opening the links, and it certainly couldn't hurt. Is that right? I think it couldn't hurt. And I would say that you know a student that attends a high school visit or a college fair and has a conversation with one of my colleagues or attends a virtual information session, they're just going to be better equipped to answer our supplement questions. And they're going to be have a greater understanding or better understanding of McAllister. I mean, ultimately, you know, this idea of fit is a two way street. And and so if a student is just applying to McAllister because they were told to, or they uh, their counselor put it on the list, but they don't know anything about it, and then they apply to us, um, they haven't set themselves up for success in that they haven't, they don't know about us. And, and I think that one of the, the, the key elements of this process at the beginning of it is to understand the schools you're applying to. And so by coming to events or participating in something is, is not only educating the student on is McAllister a good fit, but it also is showing us, hey, you're interested in us too. And so I think as not every school is going to track demonstrated interest or use it in the selection process, but the students that do participate tend to have stronger applications or have, tend to have a better angle when responding to different application prompts that colleges might have, including McAllister. Well, we appreciate that insight. And I like how you put it. Fit is a two-way street, as we all know. There's definitely more than one school for every student, but not every school is for each student. And so to your point, the importance of doing your research and engaging, um, very important. Again, regardless of whether it's tracked during the application process or not, very important to engage, do your research and learn whether or not a school is the right fit for you. So thank you so much for that comprehensive answer. I really appreciate it. And does McAllister have an honors program and if so, how are students considered for the program? In other words, do they have to apply separately? Would they be selected for it? Any insight would be greatly appreciated. So we don't have an honors program that students will apply to in the, the first year experience. We do have opportunities for students once they're at the college, um, once they are a McAllister student. You know, the beauty of a liberal arts experience like McAllister College is you actually don't need to know your major until the end of your second year. If it's earlier, great. If it's not, it's okay because there's the emphasis on, on the exploration and the journey of discovering what a student wants to, to experience. And so we don't have an honors program. And, and in fact, every student that's coming to this experience is, is seen on a level playing field. And so everybody coming in was admitted because we feel like they're going to be successful at the college. We do offer merit scholarship to students based off their application credentials. And that is across the board. Um, I think that I, I understand how honors programs can be really successful and helpful at larger institutions, but I feel at McAllister, all of our students are exceptional. What's up, podcast friends? I'm happy to share that we've teamed up with Dormco to make your dorm decorating a lot easier. Why Dormco? They offer quality and durability, affordability, and a wide selection for bedding to storage solutions and everything in between for your dorm room. So if you or anyone you know is looking to decorate your dorm, see the affiliate partnership link in the show notes for Dormco, your one stop for stylish, affordable, and quality dorm essentials. Please note that if you make a purchase through any of our affiliate links, the podcast gets a commission, but rest assured that we would only promote products that we believe in and feel would benefit our listeners. Thank you all and best wishes. Well, we appreciate that insight and explanation. Thank you so much. And I know, of course, that McAllister, like many other schools nowadays, is in fact test optional. Can you share the percentage of students that applied and who were ultimately admitted that did not submit their test scores? Yeah, it has been about 50-50 for us for students applying. And I was at a, on a panel 
in April, and and that was sort of across the board for a lot of colleges. I don't know if you're hearing that answer from everybody we too, are. John, <laughs> but are. of our admitted students, about 56% of our students did not submit an ACT or SAT. So uh, for us, I think that just speaks to you know a volume of students that we think are exceptional, and we're really diving into their transcript or really diving into to all those pieces because the transcript is the number one, um, the one or one piece for us, the, the biggest key for us um, in understanding a student's ability to be successful at McAllister. I think if a student feels really confident about their scores, I think it's it's important for students to also be looking up class profiles for the schools they're applying to, and if they feel like their scores are in range and they feel like their scores are going to um, show them in in a light they think is 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 um, helpful um, <laughs> to put it lightly. Uh, uh, then I think students should submit. But but I when I first my when we first changed made the change in 2020, we had done a series of, of test blind um, uh, evaluations of past applications to see if there was any real significant difference in our academic ratings for students with testing or within the absence of testing. And we found there wasn't because I think it can be really helpful for some students in some contexts where maybe they're at a kind of an ultra competitive high school that doesn't give out A's or something like that. And they feel like the <laughs> testing is going to be a better indication. Then I, I think it's, it's having that conversation with your high school counselor. And if right. there isn't a high school counselor that is available, it's having that conversation maybe with your admissions representative as well. And I think you should, as, as students that are out there listening to this, uh, prospective students, juniors and, and seniors, that a student asking me, should I submit my test scores or not, isn't going to make any difference in the selection process. <laughs> You're not revealing anything to me by asking me those questions. Um, that's not how we operate. We use holistic admission. We look at everything. I love when students advocate for themselves because a student that advocates for themselves in this process and asks questions like testing questions shows me that they're going to be a student that's going to make the most out of their college experience because they're asking the right questions and they're feeling confident enough to do that. And we obviously want to have an environment where students feel like they can ask those sorts of questions. So if a student feels strongly about their testing, then they should absolutely include it. But I don't miss it. I guess what I'm trying to say is as a reader, I don't miss it. Well, that's fantastic. I appreciate you talking about your holistic approach, the fact that students, yes, advocate for yourselves. That's something that, you know, reps take into account and they appreciate that. But I also like how you talked about the transcript being, in fact, the most important part of the academic portion of the overall application. The transcript shows you four years of challenge, right? 9th, 10th, and 11th grade. In 12th grade, obviously, you're not going to get the grades yet, but mm -hmm. you're checking to see if they're continuing with the rigor, if they're continuing to challenge themselves and build ramps. So again, that's great insight. We really appreciate it. So I was curious, talking about the test optional movement, where do you see it going over the next few years? Well, we will stay as we are. We are permanently test optional. And I feel like a, a number of institutions, peer institutions, continue to practice that. Or they will say we, we intend to evaluate it in three years or every year. I have just heard of a small handful of schools that have returned to requiring testing. I think the, the common... Um, the thread for, for those institutions is that they have engineering programs. And so I, I feel like there's some colleges, universities that because of their academic offerings may move to back to being um, testing preferred or mandatory testing. And, and so I, 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 you know, have, I have thoughts about it, but it, you know, it's up to the institution. And, and I think it can be very complicated when you have faculty that maybe still believe in, certain parts of standardized testing to, to really be able to demonstrate if that student's going to be successful in their program. We don't feel like that's required, of course. So I, I, I think it's fascinating. I think it's fascinating <laughs> to see what's happening. Um, and, and as someone that has been in admissions for, you know, um, over 16 years at this point, wow. um, to see <laughs> so much change happen in such a small period of time. I feel like, you know, we, our process has been pretty stagnant and pretty same. <laughs> um, but, you know, in the last um, last four years, uh, just to see the significant change has been really wonderful. To see schools really thinking about how do we best serve the students 
and not just coming from the position of I am this institution and we we make the rules and you have to abide by our rules, but we're not going to keep in account how the, the changing population, um, the changes that are happening with this this generation, and they're just approaching education differently. And and I think the the only way institutions are going to survive is if they are listening and being mindful of the needs of the students. So if you're an institution that chooses to go back to testing and you see a significant drop in applications, there's something there. There's something right. there. So I, you right. know, I, I, we'll see. I think we'll see what if those institutions that have chosen to go back are going to see application decline when we also know that we have, um, uh, you know, enrollment decline ahead of us too in the, the number of, of college bound seniors too. So I'll be watching. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll all be watching. And that's a great insight, of course. I appreciate that you talk about the fact that you're going to remain test optional permanently, but also how you talked about other schools, right? One of the trends that we're hearing on the podcast is that many schools will likely remain test optional. However, be aware if you're applying to a specific major, you mentioned, for example, a school that is big on engineering, they may require the test for the specific major. So it's very important students and parents to do your homework, do your research and reach out to the reps just to make sure that you're not missing any part of the application, obviously. And And speaking of, Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I I just wanted to add, John, sorry to interrupt. Uh, Just wanted to add that some schools also will require testing for merit scholarship. That was, there was a nuance to that, that I became aware of as I was helping guide my niece through this process. And, (laughs) And so you have to read the fine print to your point, have to read the fine print. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for adding that. You're absolutely right. That's another thing that has come up for merit scholarship as well. So these are great questions to ask the admissions reps, of course, to all of the schools that you're applying to students and of course, the parents. So as admissions professionals, how do you determine the number of applicants to accept, waitlist, and even deny when you clearly receive far more applications from deserving students than your seats available? That's a great question. And I like to talk about this when doing any sort of programming with juniors to really have parents and students understand what happens behind the scenes, because it probably feels like just this big wall um, and, and unknown, <laughs> you know, what what is happening. So a lot of it is is really institutions, colleges like like McAllister, it's our senior leadership are identifying how many students can we have on campus. We are a small residential college, so we're around 2,100 students, but our last two classes have, were just exceptionally large. You know, part of it was uh, the our trends and their rates and, and sort of our yield rates look different in a COVID pandemic context. I think a lot of institutions um, definitely felt that. And in addition to being test optional as well. And so you have all of these pieces in play that um, made kind of our predictions look a little different or maybe act a little different. And so we have to be very aware of that in our process. As a college that that needed to not have as big of a class, we just needed to be really mindful of the number of students that we were admitting in our different rounds. And so we have always every year a tremendous cohort of exceptionally talented and bright and curious and wonderful applicants to McAllister College. And every year we have, um, you know, a, a significant amount of them we're not able to offer admission to. And so that is something that I've, I've, you know, thankful as I've been in this work more, it's easier for me to, to, to handle that part of the, the process, but it is uh, for, I think all of us and our staff difficult at times because we see such tremendous potential in so many of these students that apply. So we need to be really mindful of not only um, having uh, a class of students that are coming in through our early decision process, we're also, we have two outside um, uh, partnerships as well. We're part of the QuestBridge National College Match, and we're also a Posse school too. Posse is also a nationwide program that really emphasizes leadership. Both of these programs offer full tuition scholarships. And so we need to think about 
we have space for those students, the students within our early decision round. And then of course we have early action, which also has a November one deadline and regular decision that is a January 15 deadline. So we wouldn't want to admit everybody in that those first three rounds, <laughs> right? We, we also need to secure space and have space for our students to come through regular decision. So we need to just be exceptionally strategic. And sometimes that just doesn't make sense to students and families. And, and I understand that. And um, but we have our um, institutional priorities. And, and part of that is, is that we do need to have only a specific amount of students that come on campus. We're not like other institutions where we can just continue to build because um, we're, we're in a metropolitan area. So, you know, we we'd have to knock down some really beautiful Victorian homes and we don't want to do that. So we, we need to be really mindful that we're not overextending ourselves in the different rounds. Um, and that's why we also have the wait list. And we also have a program called admit to gap. So students that are put on the wait list have the opportunity to say, you know, actually I, I really love McAllister. I'd really love to be here. And if admitted in the admit to gap program off of the wait list, that actually allows them to, to be an incoming student for the next academic year. So not the one in within our the calendar year, but so for example, students that are being in, admitted to our Admit to Gap program would start classes in fall 2024. So we recognize that there are students that just love McAllister and really want to be a part of our experience. And so we have that all the way that extends all the way to May. So it is, uh, it's very complicated. It is always amazing to me when we land within a certain amount um, <laughs> because uh, it's all really based on the choices of young people and young people who are at different stages of the process and who may have with sort of the rising rates of students applying to multiple colleges, um, it, it's, it's harder to determine where students will go and what is the determining factor to um, so we're very thankful, you know, being outside of, of the pandemic context where students couldn't visit, now they can visit. And so we just need to be really mindful. So on, on the whole, we've had to be pretty conservative and, and more reserved in our offers of admission just to, um, to ensure that we don't over-enroll as a college. Well, we appreciate that, particularly the insight that you shared regarding your yield and how it has shifted after the pandemic, which has made it even more challenging for you. I like that you talked about your Admit to Gap program. So I always put the Office of Undergraduate Admissions in the show notes. If there are any other links that you want me to share with the students and their parents, just send them to me. And of course, we'll make them available in the show notes. So I was also curious because the Common App asked the same questions, regardless of which school you're applying to. Many schools, however, add supplemental questions to gain additional insight into the student. How many supplemental questions does McAllister ask students to answer? And what are you trying to learn from potential student supplemental responses above everything else available to the general common app questions? Great question. So we have two additional prompts that are optional for students to complete once they select McAllister um, as a college they intend to apply to in the common application, they have the opportunity to answer one of our questions that's related to identity and, and recognizing that the, the common application is, is great and sort of getting the basics of demographics and all of those um, important pieces for us to have. But it doesn't really get at a student's identity uh, in a way that maybe students feel they'd like to express their identity and things that are important to them. And so we have a question that asks that specifically, um, you know, understanding that uh, it can be sort of binary, the, the nature of the questions in the common application. And, and this, that isn't a dig on the common application at all. <laughs> um, it's, it's a wonderful tool. I'm so grateful for it is that this identity question has been a great opportunity for students to talk about something that's really central to who they are as a young person. And so that could be their faith. We've had students that talk about um, that they have a significant faith practice that they want to continue in college, but has helped really shape who they are. Students can talk about their gender identity as well in, in, in a space that um, it's not going to be present in any other aspects of the application. 
we've had students talk about, you know, being refugees, students talk about, you know, being in a family with mixed citizenship status. And so these are huge things for the students. And here is an opportunity to share that information with the application readers. And, and we find that that identity question can be really wonderful and just understanding our students. And so if we know that a student has, you know, a significant, um, faith practice, for example, it's going to make a lot of sense when I go to their activities list and then I see that illustrated in their engagement with their faith, for example. So we love the identity question. Uh, We love the responses from it. It does not need to be long, but we find that that students on the whole are grateful to have a space to talk about it too. Our second question has to do with our location. So as I had mentioned earlier, you know, McAllister is one of just a handful of selective liberal arts colleges in a metropolitan area, and we really use the Twin Cities. And so the question is how the students feel like the Twin Cities are going to help shape their experience. This question is so intentional. You need to know where the Twin Cities are in order to answer this optional <laughs> question. So, uh, and I, I, I fully expect students to Google the Twin Cities. I fully expect <laughs> them to Google St. Paul. Like that, that, that's what I would do as well, is I try to figure out where is this place? And that is exactly what we want to have happen. You know, I, I think it's so important when we think about fit that students applying to McAllister, they could do that Google search and say, you know what, it's too big for me. Or you know what? It's too small for me. Or it's one of it's. Or you know maybe I I don't like snow. You know all of right. these things. Right. And and then again they're going to be more informed in in their application. And then they're going to be really informed in how to address that prompt. And so I think it is. It requires some steps that help just confirm to a student that this is the college they want to apply to. And then I think what when I see them done successfully, those supplements is when they make it about themselves. Right. I actually ran um, our supplement questions through chat GPT because I was really <laughs> curious to see what the responses would be. And I have to say the responses were super boring. Um, <laughs> they're just really boring and really like uh, the, the location one especially was like a traveling bureau sort of description of the <laughs> Twin Cities. And so uh, when they're done well is when, you know, a student getting back to that experience, like a student who is maybe really connected to their faith for example, or, you know, is a a champion figure skater is that they can make that connection in those supplements as well. Like we expect to see that a student will personalize the answers to those supplement questions. Because again, it's, it's letting us know, I see you, McAllister, I see what you have to offer. And now I want you to see me and see how I can engage with your community. Well, that's a great answer. And I love how you talked about the fact that ChatGPT, although it gives a good answer, but there's no personality in that answer. So students, the takeaway is to show off your personality, whether it's your essay or a supplemental. And I do appreciate how you talked about the supplemental, specifically the second one, how you asked them to talk about why they want to be in the Twin Cities, for example. That's really asking the students to demonstrate their understanding of your area, which is very important in terms of determining whether or not they're the right student for McAllister, but in fact, if McAllister is also the right school for them. So we really appreciate that answer. That's terrific. And what are some actual examples of college essays that left an impression on you? And what other advice would you share with prospective students in terms of what to think about when preparing to write their essays? I I think the best answers to supplement questions and to the personal essay prompt in the common application or the essay prompts in the QuestBridge application are students really centering it in who they are. And I know that can sound very trite to students that are getting a lot of feedback on college essays that be yourself, be authentic. But that's the reason, there's a reason why we keep saying it. We're all saying it is, is the, the last thing we want is for a student to be writing an essay um, just saying, you know, I, I want this just total stranger on the other side of this process to read this essay and know that I'm, you know, I'm a brilliant, curious student. And this is what it's going to sound like. So I sound like a brilliant, curious student. I think you're going to sound like a brilliant, curious student when you're using your natural voice. Right. And, and when you're excited about the content that you're writing, the best essays I read are ones that you can tell they're just having fun. 
they're having fun with it. And there are some students that are natural writers. They love to write. They write a lot. They might also be, you know, editor in chief for their literary magazine, or they, they just naturally love writing about themselves. There are also students that are on the other side of that and that they don't like writing about themselves. They maybe have never written about themselves. Um, they maybe have never been in a class where they have the opportunity to really um, to, to write how their approach to something or their philosophy on life and these other pieces. And so I acknowledge the spectrum is vast. And for some students, writing an essay is huge for them. It's monumental for them. And for some students, it is super easy to do. And so I think for those students where they're feeling really stressful about that process is that you have to give yourself time to do it. And, and you know, have a, a for those that are applying, that are rising seniors, having the opportunity to use the summer months to really think about what you want to write and just write some drafts. And there's there's no deadline yet. So, I mean, if, if you can find a space where you can write some drafts or sign up for a workshop, you know, McAllister offers summer workshops called Workshops Wednesdays, and there are recordings available all the time as well to guide students through that process to just to give yourself the time and space. And even if you're a student that likes, you know, likes the deadline, likes the the all nighter, likes to push up in, until the last minute, uh, be kind to yourself and don't do that. And give yourself enough time to write it, have, be able to pass it around to friends and family for some review as well. But try to have as much fun as you can and try to to set yourself up for success by giving yourself enough time to to properly write these these essays and prompts. I I think off the top of my head of ones that I thought were really successful, they were pretty simple. Uh, I one of them that sticks out for me is a student wrote about how they their you know, weekly chore was to to mow the grass and <laughs> and that was something that they had to do and so it was about mowing the grass but of course it was more than that it was about what will it mean when i'm not here to mow the grass when i go to college who's going to mow the grass <laughs> while i'm gone you know and and it it just it was it was tied back to the students um family and just the connection they have with the family and being a family contributor so here a very very simple topic but it was really powerful powerful and that that was just the vehicle the way the grass right. it was really about the connection to the family so finding that thing that is really meaningful for the student uh, when writing the essay I, I think is key and of course like I said multiple times now give yourself time to actually write them hey podcast friends are you or someone you know in need of some custom college gear Prep Sportswear carries a wide variety of college fan gear and apparel, including T-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, hats, and so much more. So whether you're getting ready to go to the game, hanging out on campus, organizing a college bed decorating party, or you're simply looking to build upon your college gear, Prep Sportswear has you covered. Check out our Prep Sportswear affiliate partnership link in the show notes for all the details. Please note that if you make a purchase through any of our affiliate links, the podcast gets a commission. But rest assured that we would only promote products that we believe in and feel would benefit our listeners. Thank you all and best wishes. Absolutely. And I appreciate that you talked about your workshop Wednesdays. That's something that we should definitely link in the show notes because it sounds awesome. Sure. And you're right. You have to take your time. As we all know, good writing is rewriting. So start it, let it go, come back to it a day later, a week later. Again, students, good writing is rewriting. So take your time. We can't emphasize that enough. Yes. And aside from academics, what can you tell us about what makes a student stand out in the overall admissions process? Yes, I, we get this question a lot. Uh, you know, when colleges are building classes, when they are thinking about the, the students that they want to be on their campuses, and, and especially as some colleges are, are more selective in this process, they have just more applications to read. And, and a, a side note about selectivity can be really, really overwhelming and intimidating to students. It's important to note that there are selective colleges that receive a, just a significant amount of applications each year, you know, up to you know, 60,000 applications that they need to process. And so they have to go through and identify you know, the students they think are going to be successful. Similar to McAllister, we just have more applications than the, the opportunities we have to offer admission. And so one of the things and one of the, 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 the tools that we use to help shape a class is 
is this student, looking at the student and the application, is this student going to contribute to our community in a positive way? We know that we're an active campus. So when we look at students' applications and we look at the activities that they do, we need to see that that student is, one, curious, one, interested in who we are as a college. Um, We feel like is going to be successful at an institution like McAllister that really values global citizenship, that really values the different identities our students bring to the college, because they are very, very different. There isn't one McAllister student. There isn't one type. There isn't a mold in that space. And so we want students who have been active in in some aspect of their community, but also within the context of that student. We have students coming in who have a significant amount of of family contribution that they need to, to do every single day. Maybe it's watching an elderly family member, or maybe it's watching a sibling. So they might not have the opportunity to, you know, be in a ton of student organizations or be in club sports or in varsity sports. And so we do look at the student in the context of their experience, going back to that idea of holistic review. But that student that still maybe has significant family contributions is still actively engaged in helping their community and their immediate family. We want students that are going to contribute to our communities because the last thing we'd want at McAllister is for, you know, a percentage of our students that never leave their their residence hall that are <laughs> only interested in Netflix and TikTok and all of those things and they're not interested like that sounds awful to me we want they, you know, so they can do those things but we don't want that to be their experience we want them to be going to student organization events we want them to be um, cheering on our women's volleyball team we want them to participate and so what makes a student stand out what is so important in this process is that if you find a college that you like that you feel like you're going to engage with and and i think we're as a, as a selective institution are looking for students that we think are going to be engaging in our community they're going to be successful academically and you can see that in the application and you can see that in their letters of recommendation um, their teachers saying the student is an active participant. Um, they might be the loudest voice. We'll also have recommendations that say the student, when they, they don't say much, but when they say something, it's pretty brilliant. You know, so so there are all types, but I think the 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 common thread is that they're all engaged and they're all demonstrating their curiosity and they're showing that there is something that they really love to do and that they're really interested in, and that could be. Um, That could be a sport. It could be, I'm really interested in research. So I've been doing all these research opportunities and and I say, oh, this is a student that's already done research. Wow, that'd be really amazing to see what they could do at the college. So I think that so much of the fit piece is also demonstrated into the college. I see you again. I see what you want in the (laughs) student. And this is this, I am that student. And let me show you how. Well, I have to tell you, that was one of the best answers that I heard. You You talked about how are you going to contribute? students, are you curious and interested in who McAllister is? For example, they are big on global citizenship and knowing whether you have been active in your own community. So they're going to determine the type of student you're going to be on their campus based on what you took part in or not throughout high school. So again, Elian, that was an amazing answer to really give insight in terms of what you look at in addition to just looking at the transcript. So I really appreciate that one a lot. Does McAllister offer any programs for students that may have had an IEP while in high school to help ensure that they continue to be successful academically once they're on your campus? So I'm fortunate to work at a college where I can confidently say all of the staff members are dedicated to the success of our students. And, and that is sort of the beauty of being at a small college as well, is that I actually know people in disability services, for example. I know um, staff members within our writing center. And being able to, as an, an admissions officer, be able to hand off to their, our support staff, I actually already know students that might need accommodations or would, be, would really flourish with accommodations as the admissions officer. And I actually let them know even before the student lets them know. So that's important, is that we are handing off the students that we've cared for through this process to ensure that they are also cared for at the college. And so 
that what happens then is the disability services, for example, will then follow up with the students if they don't follow up. So, so those connections are made. It's really important that our students, every student comes into this experiencing feeling like they have all the tools they need to be successful. So that could be um, listening devices. It could be accommodations for testing time. There are a number of different accommodations that the college offers. And all of that is determined through meeting with disability services to identify what those are. But I, they are extremely dedicated to meeting the needs of the students so that they're successful. Well, that's awesome. And it's important to make those connections, as you mentioned, as McAllister has so many programs to help students continue to be successful once they're on your campus. So we appreciate that. This has been a phenomenal conversation. Unfortunately, it leads us to the last question, which is, what are your top three pieces of advice that you would provide students and their parents getting ready for the college admissions process? Well, I would say, um, having been asked this question many times, and, and I, <laughs> my the the answer to this question has changed for me over the years, and and so this is my answer right now, <laughs> and <laughs> it could be it could be totally different a year from now. My first recommendation is for families and that student, the prospective student, to have a conversation a honest conversation, establishing rules and establishing roles and establishing boundaries right. um, that everybody knows right. what their role is in this process. And I know that can be very, very difficult for some families. It can be really difficult if you have someone that's more of a driver in this conversation, or maybe you have a parent that is like, you're absolutely going to my alma mater because we're going to go to full field ball games together. And, you know, I've always really wanted to go to, to Boston. So we're, you know, you're going to apply to a school in Boston. It's understanding what the, the rules are. The rules are that this is about the student, the student experience and, and for a parent to really investigate why are you wanting the student to go to this institution and just having an honest conversation about it so that, that student, and I guess this is more geared towards the parents, but as students, <laughs> you can ask your parents to do this, if possible, is to say, you know, this is this is what I need from you in this process. I need for you to listen. So that's number two for me. I need for you to listen to my concerns. And if you see me shutting down when you're asking me, did you do this? As a parent asking if you do this, did you do this? Did you call them? Did you send them the email? <laughs> that the student is going to sometimes shut down. Because those boundaries haven't right. been established and say, right. like, I think a good healthy thing for us is to check in maybe once a week. We can have a 10 minute conversation about the college process. This is on, on Thursday nights. We're going to talk about the college process. And then I need you to not talk to me about it for the rest of the week. <laughs> um, so it's establishing those boundaries and the roles. So first, establishing roles and boundaries. Second, listening to your to each other, and then and then see is to just sort of follow your gut, follow your heart in this process too. So much about being on a college campus and doing a campus tour is about the feel of it. You know, we've had students that have said, you know, I came to Callister, I took a tour, and I just knew right away this is where I wanted to be. I sat on a bench, you know, overlooking the Great Lawn, and I was like, I see myself here, and and that. It gives you some excitement to this process because this should be a really exciting process. I think we can we talk a lot about how challenging it could be, but it's also supposed to be fun. It's also supposed to be exciting. And so to to follow your intuition, um, if you take a tour and you're like, I'm just not feeling it, I you know. Yeah, there's the benefit that uh, the doubt that maybe that tour guide was having an off day. That happens. <laughs> I mean, they are young people as well that are juggling a lot of things. Um, but to to really broaden your mind, but also like be mindful of how you feel, not how you feel like others should have you feel about that college, but how you, right. the student, feel right. about that college in the process. Well, Elian, this has been a phenomenal conversation. Those are tremendous pieces of advice and great insight. I cannot thank you enough. I'm so happy as I know that this conversation is going to help so many students and their parents as they navigate through the college admissions process. And I do hope to have you again. I want, I want you to come back a year from now to see what <laughs> shifts, what changes have taken place. Thank you. You were awesome. Thank you so much. This has been so much fun. I love talking about this work and I love the work that you're doing, John. Thank you for, for really being an advocate for the students um, and bringing all this information to families through what can be a daunting and exciting process.
It is my honor and pleasure. I want to thank you again and best wishes to all out there on the college admissions process. Take care. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please don't forget to tell a friend and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. I am your host, John Durante, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Cap. I want to welcome back Sean Patel, who's the CEO and founder of Prep Expert. Sean, thank you so much for being here. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for having me, John. Just wanted to do a quick shout out for an amazing deal that we have for college admissions process podcast listeners. We're offering 30% off all prep expert SAT and ACT courses in tutoring. It's live online. We've got the best score improvement guarantees in the industry. You'll get taught by 99th percentile instructors. And you can save 30% off when you go to the show notes of the College Admissions Process Podcast. Grab your discount code for 30% off and click the link in the show notes. Thank you, Sean. So great to have you again. And to everyone out there, please note that if you make a purchase through any of our affiliate links, the podcast gets a commission. But rest assured that we would only promote products that we believe in and feel would benefit our listeners. Thank you all and best wishes. Best wishes.